just around this time last year, actually it was September 28th, which I remember very well because it was two days before the inauguration of President Paula Johnson. Yay, Paula Johnson. <laughs> uh, uh, we had an extraordinary event called Russian-U.S. Relations, What Next? And the speakers were Angela Stent from Washington, D.C., and Lilia Shevtsova, who had flown in from Moscow. And in my very long time at Wellesley, if you want to do the math, when I first came to Wellesley, the president of the United States was Gerald Ford. <laughs> Don't even go there. <laughs> in all of those years, that was the best event that I've ever sponsored, and I sponsor and organize at least three every year. And so when I learned that Lilia Shevtsova, whom we had flown in from Moscow, actually is in residence at Harvard this semester, and we just have to fly her in from <laughs> Harvard Square, <laughs> um, I just leapt into the breach. There wasn't much of a breach. But anyway, I leapt into it and invited both Lilia Shevtsova and Angela Stent to come back for a kind of reprise. When they spoke last year on September 28, 2016, the format was from the American perspective or the Western perspective and the Russian perspective, how will things look if, as we expect, Hillary Clinton will be elected president? And how will things look, who can tell, if Donald Trump gets elected, but why take that seriously? I think a lot has changed since then. And so I was really delighted when they both accepted my invitation to return. It's a great honor and pleasure to welcome them back. Um, Angela uh, Stent and I, as since we've known each other so many years that when I mention the number of years, she says we met in kindergarten. So. Um, it goes back a very long time, basically our entire adult lives. We've known each other, and um, she's had an extraordinary career uh, teaching at uh, a number of colleges and universities, and for many, many years now, for some decades, at Georgetown University, whereas, if I get this straight, she has long since been the director of the Georgetown University Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European studies. She's also formerly National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia, has written several books um, in international relations. The most uh, recent is The Limits of Partnership, uh, U.S.-Russian Relations in the 21st Century. And so that's really extraordinary, and I'm so happy to welcome Angela Stent back. Um, and uh, we also have Lilia Shevtsova, whom we actually, I only met last year, but we've become very good friends since then. She's an associate at the Chatham House in London. She's uh, a fellow at the Russian Academy of Sciences. And this semester, she's exactly sh Catherine W. and Shelby Cullum Davis, I think you know the family. Um, senior scholar at, at the Harvard University's Davis Center. She's written uh, many books. I uh, picked up here um, one of the ones from my shelf, Putin's Russia. Uh, another one called Lonely Power about uh, Russian styles of leadership, I think going even farther back. And she's going to be speaking about the Russian perspective in Russian-U.S. relations. So uh, we're going to have Angela speak, f or Angela Stent, or Dr. Stent, speak first, and then Dr. Shevtsova later. But I'm going to ask you to warmly welcome both of these powerful women <laughs> back to Wellesley. And we're going to begin with um, Angela Stent. And An Angela, if you want to speak either from the podium um, or not, here's an open bottle of water <laughs> rather than... A closed one. Okay, can you all class. hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Nina, for that generous uh, introduction. It's wonderful to be back here again. As you said, when the two of us spoke last year, it was, let's say, a very different time. Uh, I spent most of my time then talking about what I thought Hillary Clinton's policies toward Russia would be when she was president. 
I went back and looked at my notes, believe it or not. I keep all my notes. You know, I've got my notes from undergraduates still, so you can imagine how dog-eared they are. But I went and had a look at my notes from last year's talk here. And what I said about Donald Trump was, as far as Donald Trump was concerned, and I quote, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, well, we know what happened. Now, I should also tell you that shortly after I spoke here, um, I went to Russia for the annual meeting of something called the Valdai uh, International Club Discussion Forum, where we meet with various uh, Russian officials, and there's always a session with President Putin. And so um, during that session, I asked him a question, and I asked him, I mentioned that he had said that there were three preconditions for improving U.S.-Russian relations. He said that, I think, last September. And those three were removal of sanctions, remember that one, removal of the Magnitsky Act, which is a piece of congressional legislation uh, which bars people accused of human rights violations from getting visas uh, to come to the United States. And then the third condition was drawing down NATO troops near Russia's borders to the level that they were before NATO enlargement. So we're talking about 1999. And then I said to him, Mr. President, you know, will this be your opening position when you meet with a new president? And I used the pronoun she. Now, interestingly enough, just before I came here yesterday, I looked at the Russian translation of my question, and they used the pronoun he. Um, and I don't know whether that was retroactively or not. Anyway, uh, President Putin then looked at me and said, you know, I can tell you're not a diplomat, you're a professor. Uh, you know, diplomats never reveal what their negotiating position is before they start negotiating, which is, of course, true. Um, uh, but what he did say at this session was um, that he, he blamed Western elites for neglecting the needs of the population. Uh, and he said, this is why you have populism in the United States and in Europe. Um, and uh, he had some very positive things to say about candidate Trump. Although I have to say then he was kind of careful what he said about Hillary Clinton. Well, I think none of us could have imagined a year ago where we would be today in many ways. <laughs> um, uh, although we knew last June that there had been some Russian interference in the uh, American elections. We knew as early as June that there were questions about uh, the Podesta emails, if you can remember back that far, because so much has happened since then, uh, that were made public and other emails that were leaked and published on WikiLeaks. We knew something about um, the Russian role in that. It was all rather vague. Um, so today, um, of course, we have a tsunami of daily revelations, right? Every morning you get up and you switch on your phone about contacts between different members of the Trump election team and different Russian officials or businessmen. We have questions about Russia's Facebook and Twitter uh, interference, about ads that have appeared in Facebook and Twitter. And I see today that Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has a full page ad in all of the major newspapers that I read today saying, you know, we take this seriously and we're going to do something about it. Um, and then, of course, there are revelations about the contacts between different members of the Trump family and different Russian individuals. So the list is endless. It goes on and on. And so, of course, as a result of this, it has been impossible for President Trump to make the deal with President Putin that he said he would make were he elected. And this is something we did talk about um, a year ago. It's been impossible because of the domestic constraints there. U.S.-Russian relations today are worse than they were at the end of the Obama administration, and they're really worse than at any time they've, uh, they've been since before Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. Um, and so what I want to do tonight, and I'll welcome all your questions and discussion, is sort of outline how we got here, what the current state of play is, and then give a few scenarios for where we might go going forward, because really um, there's a lot that we don't know. So preliminary um, you know, remarks on this is that every US president since 1992 has come into office believing that he could improve relations with Russia, that somehow his predecessor hadn't understood this properly, and if only he found a more productive way of interacting with Russia, then we could really have a much better relationship with Russia. Um, and all of these efforts, as we know, have failed. They've, um, they've ended in disappointment. Um, because once the Soviet Union collapsed and once Russia jettisoned Marxist-Leninist ideology and said that it wanted to be part um, you know, of the civilized world, um, 
people believed in this country and in many Western countries, the major obstacles to improving ties with Russia had been removed. We didn't have this ideological confrontation anymore. Um, but as I say, each of these attempts has ended in disappointment. Um, and today we have something really unprecedented, which are called, I'm just going to call them Russiagate investigations. Um, I'll talk about them a little bit, but there's so many of them, um, it's hard to keep them all um, in one's head. Um, but I think the message that you, know, you need to understand is that the real impediments to improving relations are structural. They're not you know, whatever happened during the election campaign, not that that isn't an irritant and that's not important, it's important, but these are structural and they go deeper um, than you know, whatever is in the news today um, or yesterday. Uh, Washington and Moscow, we have very different ideas about what a productive relationship would look like. We understand that very differently. For President Putin, whose mission has been to restore Russia's role on the world stage and to negate what he sees as the disastrous legacy of the 1990s, for President Putin, the fundamental goal is to have the United States treat Russia as if it were the Soviet Union. It's not the Soviet Union anymore, but he would like the US to treat it as if it were the Soviet Union. That means recognizing it as a great power, a fully sovereign power, whose neighbors only enjoy limited sovereignty, who don't have full uh, power of self-determination, as America's equal, and recognizing that its interests, however they're defined, are as legitimate as America's interests, uh, and that they must be respected. Now, other things that President Putin has said is that he has praised the Yalta system. He's done that quite consistently in the last few years going back to the conference in 1945 when the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain at that point, although Britain then uh, lost its empire, kind of divided the world, divided Europe into two halves. So he has now praised that system. He said it saved many lives, it ended the war. And so we, it looks as if his vision of what he would like going forward be to have now a tripartite Yalta system. That is to say, the United States, Russia, and China, because China is obviously a major player now, agree to divide the world up into different spheres of influence. Uh, and each one uh, uh, says that promises not to interfere in the other country's sphere of influence. So going back to what the world looked like more or less between 1945 um, and 1990. And it also, from President Putin's point of view, means an explicit uh, American commitment not to interfere in domestic Russian affairs, domestic politics, um, and, and, and to leave that out, which of course is something that we did hear, by the way, in President Trump's inaugural, inaugural address, that the United States was not going to be interested in uh, telling other countries how they should run their countries. Um, now, we can debate whether maybe President Trump and maybe some of the people around him or people who were around him and have now left the White House, they might subscribe to this worldview. We can debate that. But obviously, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor that we have, they do not subscribe to this view, as you can see in what they've said um, and more or less what they're doing. Um, and any American administration that subscribed to this kind of worldview would really be rejecting the fundamental premises at least that have guided American foreign policy since the Soviet collapse. Um, so uh, that's the one worldview. So the other thing we hear a lot about nowadays is, well, we have to focus on interests that we have in common. Um, and we'll be, I'll be talking about that a little bit more. So what we can say is we both have a unique responsibility as the two nuclear superpowers. Um, again, this is where the kind of going back to treating Russia as if it were the Soviet Union. We are the world's two nuclear superpowers. We have a unique responsibility, if you like, for uh, global peace and also ensuring that there is not no more proliferation of weapons um, of mass destruction. But the problem is uh, when we come to some of the definitions of that and exactly how dangerous certain forms of WMD proliferation are, we can then get into disagreements about that. And we certainly have dis different disagreements about who's a terrorist, um, and I will come back to that too. Um, and then I think the other important point, and this is again a structural, if you like, asymmetry, unlike the US relationship with China, which is tremendously important economically, you know, despite all the issues that we hear about today, uh, Russia is not important economically for the United States. The two things that it exports, 
oil and gas and military hardware are not things that the United States needs. And therefore, we don't have a group of stakeholders um, in the private sector in the United States who are pushing for improved ties. Whereas if you're talking about our relationship with China, um, it's of a completely different order of magnitude. So um, that's another major difference. Um, and I would say that given how bad the relationship is now, I think things are only likely to improve at the margins over the next few years. Um, and a wholesale reset is really out of the question, whatever, again, President Trump said when he first came into office. Um, because the United States still understands that it has to limit the extent to which Russia be can become a spoiler or and can continue to be a spoiler um, internationally. So as long as you have Russian troops in Ukraine, and as long as Russia continues to deny that it has troops in Ukraine, uh, this is a major problem. Um, as long as Russia continues to support Assad's forces, and obviously Assad is doing much better now in the civil war in Syria, as long as it does that without taking steps to end some of the carnage in Syria and, and, and resolve, um, uh, put an end to the civil war, um, relations will, will also, I think, be very limited. And then I think the other thing that's become increasingly clear in this administration, I mean, it's always important, but even more so now, is the role of Congress. And the US Congress, again, for reasons that I'll go into in a few minutes, has become really a major bastion of very tough policy toward Russia and great skepticism about the value um, of improving relations with Russia. Um, and we've just seen a major sanctions bill um, uh, which was passed largely with a Republican-controlled Congress to ensure that President Trump could not take uh, executive, order, executive action, unilateral action, to remove sanctions that were imposed on Russia uh, due to the Ukraine crisis and other issues, that he couldn't do that. Um, so I would say the beginning of the deterioration of this relationship um, was really once, I would say once, Vladimir Putin came back to the Kremlin. I'm not going to say he came back to power in 2012. He went back to the Kremlin. And that's when the Obama administration began to realize that it had an issue, <laughs> had a problem dealing uh, with the new Russian president. Um, uh, I, I guess the first major breach was in, in 2013 when Russia gave political asylum to Edward Snowden, uh, the National Security Agency contractor who stole millions of classified documents, took them with him um, to Russia and, and remains there today. And then, of course, um, it had to do with um, the annexation of Crimea, uh, the launch um, of a war uh, in southeastern Ukraine. Don't forget, more than 10,000 people have died in that conflict in southeastern Ukraine, and there are, more, there are about two million refugees and displaced persons from that conflict. And um, at the moment, uh, nothing really is getting better there. And then, of course, um, you get the beginning of, of the understanding of Russia's cyber interference in the election campaign. So the last time uh, that Putin and Obama met, which was just before the end of the Obama administration. And there's a great photo, if you go online, you can watch it. Um, they were um, at an Asian conference, and basically President Obama told President Putin to cut it out. And if you look at the picture, you can more or less see, uh, even though you can't hear what he's saying, you can look at the body language. So of course, at the very end of the Obama administration, uh, President Obama announced that 35 Russian diplomats were going to be expelled from the United States because they were engaged in activities that were um, not part of diplomacy, <laughs> in other words, espionage. Um, and we also closed down two Russian diplomatic recreational facilities, one outside Washington and one outside New York City. So normally, in a normal Cold War and even post-Cold War era, one country expels people for espionage and the other country takes similar measures. It's tit for tat. And so the morning after that happened, um, the Russian foreign minister, Mr. Lavrov, appeared on television and said, we're going, you know, I've handed President Putin a list of 35 Americans who should leave. And then President Putin came on and said, no, 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 that would be very 
you know, that would be petty and we shouldn't do that and let's wait and see what happens. So everybody was surprised by that because they expected, uh, uh, you know, uh, American diplomats to be uh, expelled. And so President Putin was basically saying, let's wait for the next administration. So, you know, hold that thought as you look at what happened um, uh, this year. Now, throughout the election campaign, as you may remember, President Trump consistently praised President Putin. Uh, one of the few foreign leaders that he apparently admired, whom he saw as a strong, effective leader. Just contrast that, for instance, to the way that President Trump and candidate Trump um, has treated, for instance, our ally Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel, um, uh, with, with whom he, uh, about whom he has been very critical. It's been very difficult. Um, he has said consistently he doesn't understand why Russia and the United States can't get along. Um, and uh, certainly that we could do a deal together. And so I think in the beginning, the Kremlin hoped, and I'm sure that uh, Lilia Shevtsova is going to say much more about this, the Kremlin hoped that, in fact, it would be able to turn over a new leaf uh, with President Trump um, and that the relationship really would be improved. Um, and in fact, in March of this uh, year, so two months after President Trump came into office, um, the Russian side sent a proposal to the U.S. Um, proposing a normalization and resumption of relations. And apparently the document is genuine because uh, President Putin's press spokesman has said it is. And if you look at that document, document it's quite amazing. It's very forward-looking. And it looks not only to resuming but improving ties in all of these areas. And it's as if Ukraine never happened and none of these things ever happened. So you have to ask why did the Kremlin think that it would be able to do that, but apparently it did. Um, anyway, uh, obviously the Trump administration couldn't respond to this uh, proposal because of all the uh, domestic investigations that were going on. So by August, uh, President Putin or the Kremlin had given up on uh, trying to improve relations with the US and that's when Russia announced that 755 people who worked at the U.S. Embassy and the consulates in Russia would have to leave. Now, these aren't mainly American diplomats. They are all of the Russians who've worked at the embassy, they've worked at the consulates, and they're really instrumental to our work in Russia. Um, I will just say in May, um, I was in Moscow and I gave a talk for the U.S. Ambassador, then Ambassador Teft, um, at his residence, and all of my trips and then I, uh, you know, discussions I had with people, press availability, all of that was arranged by Russians who work for the U.S. Embassy or worked for the U.S. Embassy. They're an integral part of what we do there. And so by having to let go 755 of them, it's greatly impacted on our ability in Russia to do, to give visas to Russians. Uh, maybe that was one of the reasons it was done, um, you know, and, and to carry on the work uh, that we've normally done. So that really was um, a blow. And then, of course, as you know, <laughs> as a result or in reaction to that, uh, the Trump administration announced that we were closing down the Russian consulate in San Francisco. And that consulate in the Soviet times was always open. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's never happened before. So this is unprecedented. Um, now, the, sometimes you hear hints from the Russian side that there's going to be more diplomatic tit for tat. Um, on the other hand, other people are saying, no, I mean, this is it. Secretary Tillerson, Minister Lavrov met at the United Nations in September, and apparently um, they agreed that this, would, that this was it. Well, we'll see. Um, we don't know where else it will go. Um, and then um, the other, I think, very interesting thing domestically, um, the impact of all of the Russia investigations and what happened in the election is that we have a very different domestic alignment now um, on issues that had to do with Russia. Um, many Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, and I haven't read her book that's just come out, but I guess I've heard some of the interviews, um, you know, definitely assign quite a lot of blame to Russia for the fact that she lost the election. And so many Democrats are using all, these, all of these Russiagate investigations to relitigate the election. Certainly in the Congress, the Democrats who under Obama had been more forward-looking in terms of relating to Russia have now become obviously very, um, uh, very tough on Russia. Um, but then also, as I've said, that many of the Republicans are too maybe for different reasons, but the domestic alignments are very different. Now, um, if you read the news stories, I think the core Trump supporters, the people who voted for President Trump, um, they take a more benign view of Russia. Um, that's clear from what one reads. Um, and um, uh, of course, 
you know, the, the media are also have been very critical of Trump or some of the media <laughs> in terms of um, the policy toward uh, Russia or the intentions towards Russia, partly maybe because the president himself has been so critical, at least of what I would call mainstream media and what he would call fake news. Um, and so, so there's been sort of an interesting realignment domestically in terms of, of where Russia stands. So if you were to ask me, what's the administration's Russia policy today? And obviously, that's something uh, that people ask today. And they expect if you live in Washington, you know that. And the answer is that there's no unitary policy on Russia. I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know what anyone knows. Um, so you have the White House itself. But even in the White House, you have the president. Again, if you look at what happened when he met with President Putin at the G20 summit in Hamburg, and then remember, they had an official meeting that went on so long that the first lady had to come in and break it up. Um, and then after dinner, President Trump went over and he sat and talked to President Putin. And there was no American interpreter there. The interpreter was the Russian interpreter. And that's kind of unusual uh, in terms of our own diplomatic protocol. Um, but so we, we know that, that it, this you know, might be more um, forward leaning. Um, and then you have, as I said, um, the, the State Department, the Defense Department, and the National Security Council, as opposed to people in other parts of the White House who more or less are on the same line um, in terms of dealing with Russia. Um, and then you have the Congress. And the Congress, as I said, has passed this legislation recently. It's a very, uh, the, the, the actual um, title of the legislation is Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions, CATSA is the acronym for that. And as a cat lover, I don't particularly like that acronym, but that's the, that's the, that's the acronym. Um, and the, these are sanctions on Russia, very far reaching, that were added to a congressional bill that started out as being a sanctions bill uh, that has to do with, with Iran. Um, so the point, man, in terms of the kind of consensus executive branch policy, I would say the point man on Russia is Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. And I gather today he gave an interview saying that he's not quitting. Uh, so maybe he's not quitting yet. Um, and Secretary Tillerson, a couple of months ago, laid out three pillars of American policy toward Russia. And these are quite familiar. They're very sensible. And they're really not very different from the Obama administration's policies um, either. First point is you have to push back against Russian aggression you know, where it happens. You have to have um, a resolute policy. Secondly, you have to engage with Russia on, interests of on questions of mutual interest, which are in the US interest too. You have to talk to Russia, see where we can push that forward. And then thirdly, it's important to think about the broader strategic stability. In other words, the issues that have to do with the nuclear weapons, where again, we and the Russians have to sit down and try um, and to create a more predictable, if you like, framework. Um, and uh, so again, this has been endorsed by all the main uh, cabinet members that are dealing with Russia. And we do have strategic stability talks. Um, they, they are at the level of the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, Mr. Shannon, and then Mr. Lyabkov, who's the Russian, his Russian equivalent. Um, they've had several rounds of talks. The last ones were in Helsinki. So those are going on. Then there are channels that have been reopened between our chief of the general staff, General Dunford, uh, the Russian chief of the general staff, uh, General Gerasimov. They talk to each other. Uh, they talk about deconflicting air operations in Syria. So those channels of communication are there. So this is, despite the difficulties, there are these channels of communication. And it's a very sober-minded policy. One of the people in the administration told me this week, don't use the word cooperation. Even that's a little bit stronger than we would. But at least we're engaging, we're talking, and we're trying to set up a dialogue. Uh, and then we also do have our own special envoy now, Ambassador Kurt Volker, who is our special envoy for Ukraine. And he meets with President Putin's point man in Ukraine, uh, Mr. Surkov, and they've had several meetings, uh, again, in third countries. I think the next one's coming up in Belgrade. So again, they're talking to each other. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the, the three, I would say the three most pressing foreign policy issues for this administration. Again, I'm not sure, we don't have a unified Russia policy, but we have you know, some inklings of it. Um, so the three major ones, obviously, are counterterrorism, Syria, and North Korea, particularly. 
Um, so let me come back to the question of counterterrorism. So we, we try to work with Russia on counterterrorism, and we have for some time. Um, but the Russians define the terrorists differently than, say, the US does. And if you look at the Russian, uh, I don't think it's the Russian constitution, but it's laws that, the Russian ha uh, that Russia has which spell this out. So a terrorist in the Russian conception is someone who threatens Russians either in Russia or Russians abroad. But it's very much focused on uh, the threat to Russians from terrorists. It's not a broader definition uh, of the kind of destabilizing um, impact of terrorists uh, in a broader sense. Um, and that's why, for instance, in the Syrian conflict, uh, when we were supporting different um, groups that were opposing President Assad, uh, the Russians claimed that many of those groups were terrorists. We didn't think they were terrorists. I guess now we've backed down and we're not supporting them anymore. But we had a fundamental difference of definition and interest in who was a terrorist in that conflict. Um, now, as I say, I think the United States and the other countries, our allies in the region, have largely ceded to Russia now uh, a major role in, in bringing this conflict to an end. But still, um, we have different definitions. And I think it's also important to note that at this point, Russia has reached the position where it's the only great power that talks to both Shia countries in the region, particularly Iran, Sunni countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, some of the Emirates, and to Israel. There's no other uh, great power that, that, that has the co contacts with all of those different groups. And therefore, Russia really is in um, a position uh, to, to exercise a greater influence there. Um, now, North Korea. This is very interesting, because obviously, it's, it's going on. Um, in the beginning, and you, if you listen to what President Trump said, he hoped that China would help the United States in you know, resolving this issue, right? Telling uh, Kim Jong-un that he shouldn't have a nuclear program, putting pressure on him. Um, it hasn't quite worked out like that. Obviously, we do have some new UN sanctions, and uh, we're, we're, we're inching towards greater pressure. Um, uh, and Russia, who of course, which is, of course, and this is where we come to the non-proliferation part, it's critical of the North Korean government, but it continues to have and has intensified some of its economic relations with North Korea. And then I think both Russia and China, they fear a united Korea under American domination, part of an alliance system, more than they fear a nuclear-armed uh, North Korea, Kim Jong-un, because I think somehow they still believe um, that this can be contained if, one, if there's dialogue um, is resumed. So, we, so Russia, the Russian role there, I think, um, uh, is not exactly what, um, what we might have um, wanted. Um, so the Congress, again, has published this, uh, has, uh, um, has enacted these new rules, the CATSA legislation, tougher sanctions on Russia. And some of these sanctions affect our allies, and maybe that's something we can talk about in the discussion period, too. And the Congress. Um, has said that the United States should supply lethal defensive weapons to the Ukrainians. The Obama administration refused to do it because it, they didn't want to provoke Russia. Um, probably this administration won't do it either, but the debate um, uh, is lively again. And in fact, Ambassador Volker has said that he thinks that the US should supply these lethal defensive weapons. So this is another thing that's in the mix here. Um, so. Let's look briefly um, at the different investigations. I don't want to go on for too long. Uh, that we have now the domestic investigations into uh, Russian interference in the election. Um, so the most high-profile uh, investigation is led by former FBI Director Robert Mueller. Um, he's convened a grand jury, which has been meeting in Washington for quite a few weeks already. Um, the proceedings are secret, but you know people leak things, particularly in this administration. And interestingly, he appears to have hired a lot of lawyers who are experts in money laundering and financial malfeasance. malfeasance. So people who are experts on this wide, this wide range of money laundering, you know, again, uh, financial crimes. Um, and the most publicized aspect of this investigation, again, someone leaked it, was the pre-dawn forced entry into the home of Paul Manafort, who was a former manager of uh, the Trump campaign, has close and ha always had close business ties to deposed Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, 
to various different Russian oligarchs. You know, you can read all the stories. But they actually broke down his door at 3 a.m. in the morning so, uh, with warrants. So, you know, this, this shows you <laughs> uh, part of where the investigation um, is heading. Now, we're not going to know the results of this investigation, I think, until sometime next year. But it's very active. And as I say, there's a grand jury sitting in Washington and listening to a lot of evidence. Then the Senate Intelligence Committee has its own investigation going on. And this is more into the cyber interference um, in the election, and then the, uh, the leaking, the, the links with WikiLeaks and things like that. Um, and uh, again, we don't know when we'll have the results of that. I know they're trying to get it done fairly quickly, but that's a very um, active investigation too. Um, and I think there are other investigations going on. Those are the, those are the main ones. Um, um, and uh, they're looking at some of the same evidence and some of the different evidence. So we have a toxic atmosphere, obviously, on Russia in Washington. Um, so just a little bit about where we might go, uh, where we might go uh, looking uh, forward. Um, we do have these deconfliction ties in Syria in terms of um, uh, what's happening in the air there. So we will, I think, continue and maybe improve uh, coordination, at least, with the Russians so that we don't have uh, you know, a, a mid-air collision, some unforeseen um, air accident. Nobody shoots down someone else's plane. I mean, to avoid those, the worst of those possibilities. Um, and I think that will definitely go on. Um, we have a fairly urgent need to discuss with Russia, again, uh, the renewal of the or the follow-on to the New START agreement, which limits strategic nuclear weapons. That agreement um, expires in 2021, which isn't very far away. So those talks will hopefully resume. There will be some discussions. And then there's a whole range of issues that has to do with the intermediate force range uh, nuclear missiles, INF Treaty. It's something we signed in the Gorbachev-Reagan era. Um, and the US says that Russia is violating the agreement. The Russians say, we're violating the agreement anyway. We need to sit down and talk about this, because short-range nuclear weapons are all, all also um, a major and potentially contentious issue. Um, we do have these talks um, on Ukraine going on. As I said, um, Secretary Tillerson has indicated that maybe we don't have to be bound by the letter and law of this Minsk agreement that was signed in February 2015 uh, between Russia, Ukraine, and Germany and France. Um, but if that's not going to be the basis for a negotiation, what is? So, um, I, you know, I think one shouldn't be too optimistic that anything's going to happen there, but at least they're going to continue uh, to push this forward. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are these areas where we're talking, we have to continue talking. Um, it's, it's very unlikely that there will be any breakthroughs um, anytime soon. Um, I've talked for too long, so I'm not going to go into my three scenarios. But basically, you know, the status quo, what we have now, is probably likely to last for the next three years, at least until the end of this um, Trump administration. Um, we uh, should be talking to the Russians on cyber rules of the road. That might seem paradoxical, given what's happening. But I think you have to start somewhere. We have to think about kind of cyber issues that have to do with interference in other people's electricity grids and basic power grids and things like that. Not that I'm saying the Russians would do that. But in general, there's a, you, know, you have to think about this whole complex of, of cyber issues. We do depend on the Russians to get our astronauts into the space station uh, because we don't make the, we, we can't transport them anymore. So that's one area where we'll be working with the Russians. And then we still have cooperation on the Arctic um, in the various multilateral uh, organize, you know, committees that um, exist to deal with um, strategic issues, environmental issues in the Arctic. So those are still uh, very important. So that's probably more or less um, what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's hard for me to see where the improvement in relations could come. Maybe if all of these committees suddenly re report back and say, oh, there wasn't any collusion, any collusion, there was no money laundering, no improper contacts, you know, maybe that will uh, create an environment that's more conducive to improve relations. But that's a big maybe and an if. Um, and the way that relations could deteriorate dramatically would be, and then I come back to 
uh, what I was talking about before, some unforeseen um, military collision. I haven't talked about the Baltic area where there are also a lot of dangerous, you know, there have been a lot of dangerous near misses both in the air and at sea. So something unforeseen like that um, could happen. One hopes that it doesn't. Um, and, um, uh, you know, in that case, you could see even more sanctions uh, introduced by the U.S. Congress, but at the moment, I don't think that's going to happen. So um, I don't want to conclude on a completely pessimistic note. As I say, I think, you know, at best, relations could improve at the margins. Um, but I do think the more optimistic, <laughs> or not optimistic, but the important note to end on is we are in for a period of increased and continuing tense relations. But given these realities, it's very important to remember that human contacts are still very important. Student and cultural exchanges are very important. We need to keep the contacts between Russians and Americans at different levels, civil society, you know, not looking at the government, um, including in these cultural and, and human exchanges, joint appearances by American and Russian uh, specialist to talk about these issues. So I would like to thank Professor Tumarkin from, for bringing us together and enabling us to do that. Thank you. Nina, thank you. Thank you for the treat and thank you for today's day. Thank you for the most memorable experience. We were walking around the lake, can you imagine? And it was absolutely marvelous. We were living in another world. And I forgot about Russia, America, Trump, Putin. Thank you for allowing us to forget about that. <laughs> ah, and it's such a great pleasure to be here with Angela. Sorry that, you know, we have a friendly reunion, but we would like also to make it a treat for you. Let me start with Angela. Angela, do you allow me to do it? What you heard now, for me, is absolutely amazing, unusual experience. Professor Stent now, standing here in this room, presented us structured, organized, clear, formidable perception of chaos and destruction. <laughs> Do you know anyone, expert, politician, historian, who would look at this swamp, at this mess, <laughs> and give this absolutely clear perception with trends, one, two, three, four, five, and it's clear. It's not even French impressionism. <laughs> it's formidable Picasso. I'm not joking, I'm just jealous. <laughs> Angela, uh, mm, I have some points, but you made my job so easy, because looking from my Russian misty window, I would agree with Professor Stent on major aspects. And she is answering my questions and my worries about many things. But uh, before coming to my points, which will be a kind of, you know, brush strokes, slight brush strokes to the canvas of Professor Stent. Uh, I, I want to make a conclusion on the basis of what we heard now. In fact, Professor Stent allows us to conclude, yes, in the area of U.S.-Russian relations, we have absolutely new, unique stage. Well, as if trivial conclusion. But what's important about that conclusion? This new stage has been opened by two sides in Moscow and Washington who didn't know what they're doing, who didn't, who didn't have any idea of what they're opening and what they're closing. And any kind of previous perception mechanism, Cold War, post-Cold War mechanisms, axioms, stereotypes are not relevant any war, anymore, not relevant. And all these hints and analogous <coughs> parallels, let's return back and see how it worked. It will not work. And Moscow and Washington already apparently understand it's not working, my God. They opened the cage with crocodile and then and now they're scratching their heads what to do with this crocodile. 
because every step, every rhetorical gesture that they are undertaking is compensation of lack of strategy and understanding. And this is worrisome. This is really worrisome. It never happened in our history before. And from what Angela just said, I, am, I put down, I, I, I just, uh, in my handwriting, I put down two premises, Angela's premises. Angela, premise, premise number one, uh, 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 premise number one of this new stage, new model. Prem premise number one means President Trump's power to provide, to pursue his policy towards Russia has been limited, tremendously limited. And the Kremlin is not accustomed to that. The Kremlin doesn't know the Congress is playing a role, someone else is playing a role, Trump is not that omnipresent, omnipowerful. What are we going to do? This is very important. And his possibilities, Trump possibilities, are also limited by the whole atmosphere in the American society, by the Congress unanimity you know, uh, 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 regarding Russia. So what the Kremlin is going to do now? And the second premise, you mentioned several times, this Ketsa, yes? Mm -hmm. This Sanctions Act, and I remember, I remember perfectly well, I, I've been memorizing one absolutely, you should go, you should go, who are curious, you should go on uh, uh, Google, Section 241, 241. It's amazing, sec uh, you know, section in this act. According to this section, in 180 days, the U.S. Treasury Department has to deliver to the Congress, to the congressional entities that you have, a report about all cases of corruption, all you know, sources of enrichment of the Russian ruling class, sisters, brothers, etc., etc., etc. And the report has to be uh, public, unclassified. It means that for the first time in our history, Russian and Soviet history and post-Soviet history, America has invented instrument and mechanism of influencing the Russian ruling class. It's formidable thing. It never happened in our history before. It just, you know, you know uh, uh, Americans are having a bomb, whether they will explode this bomb or not, up to Americans. But there is one very interesting trick or very interesting thing. Just imagine when all those FBI, CIA, you have so many other uh, intelligence <laughs> agencies, okay, 17 of them. Can you imagine? They sit down and produce this report in 180 days now, 120 days maybe, 100, 100 days. And the Treasury Department will look at it and say, oh no, we cannot make it public. Because, well, those Russians, they would have never done it with our assistance, with our assistance of our business community, media community, lawyer circles, with our networking. We cannot undermine, you know, the morality of the American democracy. They will never publish it. And it will be a moment of truth, the real moment of truth for American democracy. Will they publish it or not? But at the moment, the Kremlin is scratching its head. And now uh, uh, I have several, uh, if, if you don't mind, several, just several comments. Very briefly, comment number one, and I fully agree with Angela when she was talking about structural, systemic uh, uh, reasons, motivations of the Russian foreign policy. Well, I fully agree with her. Uh, well, there is bitter irony, apparently, for both Russia and America uh, in the fact that the Russian system of personalist power cannot exist in its form, cannot reproduce itself without, and Angela rightly said about that, without Russia being a superpower, at least behaving like a superpower, without being recognized as a superpower, but Russia could be, and the system of personalist power could represent superpower only in one case, by referring Russia to some important elephant, 
not referring to Ukraine, Poland, Canada, UK, you name it, but, you know, looking at the only global superpower, United States of America, and either containing it, deterring it, or having dialogue with it, you know, complaining, whining, or just sitting at the table with America. So ironically, and this is the historical trap that we are in, and Americans apparently too, the United States of, of America has become, have become, well, became an existential factor for the existence of the Russian system of personalized power. And apparently every US president, and you are writing about it in your absolutely perfect book, uh, every American president coming to the White House says, oh, I, I will do something nice and normal with Russians, and then he understands. Oh my God, you know, for Russia we mean something else. And apparently, well, huh, he has problems. But uh, I, I have a question. The fact that uh, the Kremlin would like to contain, to deter America, well, mm, to buzz American fleets and et cetera, et cetera, does it mean that uh, Russia and the Russian <coughs> uh, ruling elite would always want to be hostile to America? No. And here I'm coming to my second point. The second point is the following, you know. There were periods in our post-communist history, and we would you remember, Angela, we were writing about partnership after 9-11, you know. There was period of reset and partnership during Medvedev's presidency. So it means that the Russian system of personalist power was ready at some stage, during some moments, to tame its aggressiveness, its arrogant, arrogance, and be partners, uh, pursue cooperation with the United States of America. Why then, and this is my second point, why then this aggressiveness during the last five years? Is it like many Western and our um, American colleagues are writing, is it because Russia is uh, so insecure, because it's insecure they started to buck? Hmm. Uh, uh, sounds strange. Is it because Russia has been humiliated by America? Well, looking at Putin, I never saw any traces that, you know, he felt some new Versailles complex. Well, the response could be found in the updated uh, 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 concept of the Russian foreign policy, where it says the West, well, I, I'm just translating the official language into my language, uh, the West, you know, is, is over. It's going to pieces, it's going to, well, to shit. And, you know, the epoch of America is, has ended too. America is retrenching. That's why, guys, it's our time to fill the void. It's our time to fill the vacuum before Chinese did it. So the crisis of the West, the West and uh, a loss of trajectory, crisis within the EU and the retrenchment of America during Obama presidency, created a kind of seduction for the Kremlin, provoked the Kremlin to be cocky and to look or to find, you know, the new red line and really uh, try to fill the, uh, the vacuum. Point number three, what problem Trump creates for Moscow? I'm not going to deliberate now whether really there was collusion. I don't uh, believe in any kind of collusion between the Kremlin and Trump's uh, presidential campaign or Trump's administration. You know, if there was any kind of collusion, then the question is why Putin and the Kremlin have been constantly rejecting any attempts on the part of this gang, you know, Manafort Plus, Flynn Plus, etc., to make a deal with the Kremlin. Why they avoided them? Why they never agreed with Trump and his family to strike a deal, commercial deal in Moscow? Why? And why the initiative uh, nearly always has been on the side of the American uh, team? Why? I anyway, we'll wait for the results of the investigation, or maybe we'll never see them. Well, uh, but even if the Kremlin wanted Trump in the White House, then they made such a serious mistake, and they do understand it now. Because they do understand that Trump for Russia is such a formidable 
uh, impediment, such a formidable obstacle, such a headache, and such a disaster. Why? For many reasons, but among them, at least a couple of reasons stand out. Trump, in fact, captured one of the most effective Russian foreign policy cut that Russia has been playing until recently, the cut of unpredictability. And Putin could be unpredictable only when he understands how Americans and the West would behave. Because Trump, with his ambition, you know, to raise energy leverage, to build much more formidable military resource, is not definitely making a present uh, uh, for Russia. And because during Trump's tenure now already, Russia became uh, uh, toxic, and we see for the first time formidable consolidation of two parties and of the U.S. public opinion and U.S. political scene on the anti-Russian uh, basis, which apparently would be, Angela, what would you say, would be present at least in the short term <coughs> perspective. And what to do with that, we don't know. Next point, briefly, does the Kremlin, Putin, and uh, Putin's team want a real confrontation with the United States of America? No way. They are not kamikaze, they are not idiots. No idiots at all. They don't understand their symmetry. Can you imagine the people in the Kremlin? They don't know the US military budget of more than $500 billion, 554 it seems to me this year. And the Russian military budget, 60 something billion? Come on, who would like to do confrontation with this super, super mega power? But you could ask me, <laughs> but why this hostile rhetoric? Why this buzzing of the American fleet? Why all other unpleasant gestures? I will tell you, this is traditional, traditional, traditional historical mechanism of the Russian foreign policy to escalate the tension, to escalate and increase the risks in order to enforce love and dating. The problem now is, you know, with Obama, it was pretty easy. With Trump, apparently, it could be difficult to uh, uh, increase risks, to blackmail, to throw stones into the American window and expect that the Kremlin would be invited for dinner. Well, not only because of Trump, but because of the atmosphere in the United States and because of the uh, uh, factor that Russia has become toxic and because Every gesture on the part of the American political leaders, administration, State Department officials, et cetera, et cetera, every gesture, step, call, et cetera, will be supervised by FBI, Mala, by <laughs> 20 more intelligence agencies. Uh, what is in store for us? Angela did it brilliantly. I would only give a couple of thoughts to your to your picture. Well, I would believe that both sides will be looking with Putin and Trump in the offices without them, but at least in the prospect of the next five years. We cannot make forecasts for the 10 years period. They will be looking for a new balance of mutual containment and some cooperation on the issues that Angela has mentioned. But at the same time, it would be very difficult, impossible, for us to expect the emergence, the building up of some certain model, stable model. No, it will be a kind of moving process. The goal is nothing, the movement is everything, like Bernstein said. But what Russians and what the Russian elite expect from the relationship, are they very anti-American? Well, with the exception of some lunatics among the elite, I would say, the Russian elite, yes, pursuing anti-American rhetoric for domestic use, would not like to have any conflict, confrontation, any repetition of the Cold War, Cold Shower, Cold Spring or Cold Summer with America, due to many, many reasons, but one of the most important reasons is, for the first time, the Russian elite has been personally incorporated into the Western society. This is the key reason. And what about the population? Yes, definitely. 
Well, it looks like people, after being demoralized by this zombie, zombie TV, you know, listening every from early morning till night and um, anti American rhetoric, well, they're pretty suspicious towards the United States. But when we look, scratch the skin, look at the numbers, we'll see that 59% of Russians currently in this absolutely, you know, anti Western propaganda situation, 59%. They look at the foreign policy as the instrument to secure benevolent economic existence, not war. Only, let me see, let me check. Only 19, I looked today, I checked it. Only 19, one nine, one nine, 19 percent of Russians would like to contain the United States, and only one three, 13 percent of Russian respondents would like Russia to be an expansionist power to expand, you know, to conquer, and to have areas of influence. So people do understand that they have stomach, and the more expansionist Russia is, the less there is food in the ref refrigerator. Uh, so while we'll have a very painful, torturous process of finding the balance, containment dialogue on both sides, and finding where the red line is, and especially in the situation when Yes, Putin doesn't want the confrontation, but he cannot backtrack, he cannot lose his face. And what is he going to do, even if he backtracks on Syria, on Ukraine, on, well, on some other issues, if he backtracks, what would be the reward? What reward Trump and Americans would give him? Hardly he will get any reward. And there's another thing. If the Russian ruling elite, the Kremlin, fails to find any effective working idea for consolidation before the presidential elections in March next year, the only way to consolidate Russians, to keep them under control, will be again to throw country into the war mood, which means confrontation with America, which means throwing stones into an American window. And Besides this, not only desperation, despair, it's a dis desperate gesture. There is another thing, just a, a simple miscalculation. Miscalculation, which could throw the countries, both countries, into kind of inferno. And let me finish, and I'm looking desperately for some quasi-optimistic note. And I remember, having bad memory, I still remember. The last time I invented a metaphor thinking about our relationship uh, using Hitchcock and his suspense movies. Mm -hmm. You know, something, you know, looming, you know, in the perspective, well, we should be scary, we should be worried. But today I'm in much more cognitive dissonance mo mood. I would say that I'm looking at the relationship. I'm looking at the people who are pursuing them. I'm looking at the policy, this policy, you know, trying to tame the crocodile, in a way of mixing two great writers. On the one hand, I would use the philosophy of Alan Edgar Poe with his foreboding, you know, black humor, you know, death, deathly suicidal motives. And on the other, Mark Twain's giggle. <laughs> because just when you look at Syria, we could shoot at each other and provoke nuclear disaster. This is Alan Edgar Poe, definitely. But when we read how this jerk, you know, uh, Jared Kushner, <laughs> uh, suggested absolutely fantastic idea of uh, in creating a conference room within the Russian embassy to discuss sensitive issues between the two countries in order to, to avoid eavesdropping. <laughs> I start to laugh. <laughs> and when there is a chance to laugh, it means that, you know, not everything is so hopeless. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you so much, Leadership Sova and, and Angela Stent. You know, um, uh, oh, by the way, I would introduced myself. I'm Nina Tumarkin, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Director of Russian Area Studies. And only once in my life did I ever publish uh, a piece of humorous writing. It was a talk of the town piece in The New Yorker. I think it came out in 1990 um, uh, when I was at a convention of American Slavists. And the question is, how did American Sovietologists, who by nature uh, were drawn to the field because they were preternaturally catastrophists, <laughs> cope with the, with the concept that things might be getting better in the Soviet Union? A and it was clear that people were lost. I mean, how could you say things are good, you know? Uh, of course, actually, people in the Soviet Union understood that by 1990 they weren't good, but Americans didn't see that. And so we do, in our field, uh, create a symphony over a basso continuo that's constantly in a minor key. So this is to be expected. But then we have people like Angela Stent, who's very, I think, all sort of sober and pessimistic, but she's also a very jolly person. You know, which is great. You know, she's cheerful. And Lilia is actually not a jolly person. And she's not optimistic, but she's delightful. <laughs> um, and with that, I invite questions and answers. Uh, the answers are going to come from them. The questions are going to come from you. I've noticed, I think, would you like to sit down and each have a mic? Uh, one has a stand and one does not. This one's on. All right, you want to sit over there. There's this mic. Okay, and then we have uh, the one here, and then there's this mic. Right, I'll try to switch on. And so normally I have found that it takes about 14 seconds between the time I call for questions and then the first hands go up. So, ah, wow, fast. Thank you so much. Um, Speak loudly, we shout, because I don't want to start running. Thank you so mind. much, all, especially Ms. Um, uh, Madame. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, because <laughs> it is the first time since like, I came back to LZ and all this madness started that I actually hear the perspective that Russia doesn't want this confrontation, that they actually, maybe they didn't meddle with the election. So the way that like I have it down so far, is that there are like big pieces being ignored, like not being shown to the American public. For example, the Russia is currently in negotiations with the BRIC countries to establish a different currency that is independent from the dollar, and that is a big threat to Russian economy because the, 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 to the U.S. economy because the U.S. economy is failing, and the only way that they can uh, questions rather than statements, if you can get to a I'm question. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, but. I mean, I really need to say this because it, it needs to like build for the question. Otherwise, this, the question doesn't make sense. So, the thing is, the U.S. is failing. The only way that they can still survive is by expanding consumer pools, therefore TPP and TTIP. But that is impossible because there is this other force, this like um, counterbalancing force, creating on the other side. The other thing that like we're, like somehow U.S. population cannot see is that that. For a long, t for a long time, the wars of the U.S. against other countries have been wars of aggression, and that the econ the, the economy of the U.S. is based on the industrial military system. The question, the question, the question is, how are we still talking about this without looking at these issues, without looking at the industrial military system, without looking at the fact that the war in Syria is complete bullcrap, and that people, yes, are, I'm not trying to defend leaders here and there because. All politi political leaders have dirty hands, but the way that the, that the populations can deal with this stuff is by opening their eyes a little bit. Okay, we got the question. Thank you. Answer from either of the two speakers. I'm actually not sure what the question is. Yeah, no, I didn't send it away. So uh, um, how did we not see that America is, America is such an aggressor and all this, I think? We you know what, maybe we'll take a couple questions and then we'll respond to them together. Okay, it's very complicated. Very complicated situation. Um, maybe we can add another question and then build them together. Yes, Esme. Um, so I was reading an article um, a couple of weeks ago um, that was talking about sort of the way that Americans view Putin as a leader um, and kind of what his 
uh, sort of what his image looked like, sort of the cult of Putin that we were talking about um, a couple of days in class, cult of personality. Um, and I was wondering, Putin is getting older from the perspective of the Russian community um, because of differences in culture. Um, and he doesn't seem, at least from what the American press is saying, to have sort of a successor or, you know, kind of to be leaving a bit of a vacuum in terms of who um, is the figure uh, that represents the government. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about, like, um, if there are any internal politics that would be significant in the next couple of years um, going forward as he might step down or not. Okay, I, I will start uh, responding, but firstly, if I may, uh, your question is systemic and formidable. Uh, I would say I would maybe correct myself or edit myself because I do believe that there was a Russian meddling into the American relations, okay? But Russian factor, according to my view so far, uh, is that hardly Russia was a formidable factor in Trump's victory, okay? As for America as aggressor, et cetera, et cetera, well, regretfully, there are no moral country in the world, not a single country. But, you know, uh, at least we can compare America with Russia and China. And uh, 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 there are much more evil, you know, on a different part of the field. Regarding Putin, uh, God knows what might happen in the Kremlin today, in the evening, and tomorrow morning. Because while we are really depending on one person, if he vanishes, decides to move to the moon, well, we, have, we, we could have chaos. Well, that's the major problem. So we are not discussing now the issue of uh, a successor because, well, it's just it's futile. We are discussing perhaps the following issue. The system is not working. The system is in the state of degradation. But at the same time, within the system, there is no formidable alternative to Putin, neither on the level of the political elites, nor on the level of the society. But by the end of 2018, it's quite possible the economic situation will worsen so much that it will produce, well, according to the law of Alexis de Tocqueville, will force people somehow to think, not about their stomachs, but about their future. Well, so that's, that's why, you know, to, f to make any forecast regarding uh, Russia's development is pretty uh, precarious thing. What we have to understand, the trajectory is not sustainable in the long run. It's just like, you know, looking at Titanic, looking for its iceberg, you know? But the timetable could be absolutely uh, uh, unpredictable. Well, thank you. That was very interesting to uh, listen to you to talk. But uh, there was a, a comment that uh, I believe Professor Stent made about uh, the Russians influence in the North Korean situation. Now we have been led to believe and uh, at this point it's pretty obvious that it's not true that China doesn't have much influence over what happens to North Korea. And also um, we sometimes forget that Russia also shares a border with North Korea. It's not just China. So my question is mm -hmm. how do we get Russia involved or do we, should we get Russia involved in having this discussion with North Korea? China, South Korea, and so on. So do you believe that maybe Russia can have a little more influence, or as much, or as little as China? So that's the question. I mean, it's a great question. There are obviously a, a number of things we don't know. Um, so my colleagues at Georgetown who look at the Chinese side of it say, um, obviously China does. It's the most important country economically for North Korea. We know that. But they really aren't good political links at the top level between the Chinese and the North Korean leadership, um, that some stuff has leaked out of China where the Chinese leadership has complained about uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, and I'm sure in, you know, what's happened recently, including the assassination of his half-brother and everything, I mean, these are all things that you know, the Chinese take quite seriously. Um, and the Chinese have been willing to sign on, again, to these tougher sanctions um, against China, although, again, they do have probably they're the, they're the more important trading partner. Now, Russia, right, I mean, it does share a border. It has, um, and, and Russia has, although China 
has had taken more North Korean refugees. Russia has taken some of them too. But then, of course, you have a significant number of North Korean laborers, I guess forced laborers, who work in the Russian Federation. Um, and so um, you know, there are questions about that. We do know that, that more recently, um, as I was saying, uh, Russia's economic relations with North Korea and some of the um, you know, ceilings and things like that have started. Russia's taken up some of the slack. Um, from what happened with China. Now, the Russians also don't have good contact at a high level with Kim Jong-un. I mean, he was supposed to come to Russia in 2015 to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Um, and there was a lot of guessing, will he come? Well, obviously, he didn't come because probably wasn't a very good idea you know, for him to leave. I think the Russian position, I think the Russians, and some people are arguing now that Russia is taking a more forward position in kind of criticizing what the US is doing vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, um, because it's kind of also convenient for China to have Russia do that. Um, I think the Russians do believe that there has to be, there should be some resumption of talks. I mean, I've had um, some Russian officials say to me, actually, it's the US that needs to sit down with the North Korean leadership, not the six-party talks again, which obviously Russia was part of, because that's the only thing, you know, you have to guarantee him you're not interested in regime change, um, uh, et cetera. Well, I, d I don't see that coming at the moment, you know, out of the White House. So I, I do think that Russia is playing a more visible role now, um, in, in also in, in criticizing what the US is doing and trying to get some kind of dialogue going. But then I'm not really sure that Russia has that much leverage over what happens in North Korea. I'm not sure anybody does. Uh, I think given the sort of very bleak situation uh, of stalemate that, that you've both described pretty uh, exhaustively, one thing we should be looking at in, in the future are these proxy wars. And I was interested in hearing the other half. You mentioned the two definitions of, of terrorism and the sort of disagreement on that account. Uh, and I'd be interested in hearing your perspective as well, uh, given, you know, regarding our aid to certain organizations uh, in Syria. Um, is there, do you think, do you have a different perspective on, on the organizations we're providing aid to? Um, or, or, or maybe you could continue with your definition of, of the American perspective uh, on that situation uh, on the ground there. So would you like? Uh, maybe either of you. Like yeah. Maybe you're much better on Syria. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, first of all, I think that what I read in the papers, right, is that we're now not giving assistance to some of the groups that we were supporting before. So we've really, um, you know, we've, we've backed off a lot of that. Yeah, there were, you know, and some, to some extent what the Russians were arguing is that some of these groups that were allied with other opposition groups, not only we, the US, but we have all these allies in the Middle East whom we were working with. I mean, this is, we were not doing this unilaterally, um, that some of these groups like the Al Nusra Front and things like that were, you know, um, one could argue about, you know, again, do they constitute terror, terrorist groups or not? So that's one issue. I think the other issue is how concerned Russia is about Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, you have, I think it's the second largest group of foreign fighters fighting with Islamic State come from the Russian Federation, obviously mainly from the North Caucasus region, I mean, you know, other parts of Russia. So in that sense, better that these people be in Syria than back home, again, where they might, they might carry, out, carry out terrorist um, attacks there. So on the one hand, um, uh, you know, so, so, so the view of Islamic State, I think, is colored by that. And then there are other people who've argued that, you know, the main concern for Russia and Syria has been shoring up President Assad, which I think they've quite successfully done, uh, keeping, obviously, their bases there and, their inf and expanding them now. Um, and that they are, you know, they understand that Islamic State still controls part of Syria, and maybe that's what it's going to be for the, in the future. So um, I think there's also a question, although rhetorically, Right, they say we should be joining with them, the US and Russia, in combating Islamic State. The question is how serious they are about that. I don't know whether you have something you want to add uh, to that. Well, I, uh, I always agree with Angela. <laughs> this is firstly. Uh, uh, and she knows much better about these things. I have a feeling, I have a feeling that, firstly, Moscow tries to find an exit solution from Syria. The war in Syria is highly unpopular within the society and among the political elites, okay? That's why very often uh, Russia sends as military police the representatives of the North Caucasian republics because, well, in this sense, 
it, it, you know, mm, uh, you know, the consequences will not be too painful for Russians. But there is a question that definitely Moscow wants to control and wants to pursue. Uh, control over gas and oil fields in some parts of Syria. And here we have some controversies. On the one hand, Russia succeeded. On the other hand, there are controversies, uh, 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 disputes among Russians, Hezbollah and Iran now. So this is a new level of contention. How it will end, I don't know. But definitely, Putin will be looking to get out. At this point, what might it take to leave the situation in terms of these elites? So if we talk about the elites, we know that they are, you know, super governmental powers who are able to heavily influence the Congress and like rely on like money that lies in the US, particularly in the industrial military system. How can we have, how can we produce a constructive conversation about that? Because let, tell me if, I, if I'm guessing this wrong. I am guessing that the US wants confrontation. In fact, if we look back at Obama and he won a Nobel Prize to destitute nuclear weapons, he put trillions of dollars in upgrading bombs, V6112, uh, I, I think when it's called, that have higher range, smaller range. At the same time, we were funding the white helmets that were producing all of the propaganda. So these are all signs that the US wants to go to confrontation. How can we have a constructive conversation about that, okay. please? We hear the question. Yeah, well, I reject the premise that the US wants a confrontation with Russia. And I don't really think the Russians want a confrontation with the US. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> But, but yeah. you know what? Uh, hmm. Would you like to come to Russia? <laughs> I mean, if I have the money. So oh, well, sure. you can come, and there are a couple of TV channels, etc. They would love to have you on the official TV, you know? <laughs> really? Come, you know, you'll be the star. And, and this is what we are learning in on our the Kremlin propaganda channels. This is what we are learning in our news and politics class, but there is only a certain amount that we can go and say, you are doing propaganda for the Russians. I think that to some extent it becomes ridiculous. Okay. Because we have so, so does anybody any else have any, any questions or comments about the possibility and future of Russian-US relations? Do people feel um, sanguine? Um, do they, uh, uh, I mean, I, I would like to ask a question about um, whether you think that President Putin, now that he's uh, up for re-election, of course, he's going to get re-elected. But the Kremlin always does appear as though they really worry about it. I mean, they re it's going to be a campaign. And it's going to be a campaign of a much older candidate. He's about to turn 65 years old. Um, you know, he had this whole new cemetery built, you know, a federal cemetery um, up in Moscow he's got, where he's going to get buried eventually. I, mean, I think they're thinking about, about the end time. So um, do you have any thoughts about what Putin might be pushing in his, the sort of the, the sort of lichadatka, the feverish part of his electoral campaign and how he might be seeing probably his last and fourth term in office and what his legacy might be. Firstly, uh, Nina, thank you for this wonderful question that you nearly responded to with your question. Uh, firstly, it's too early to think about his legacy. You know, it depends on which side you are. I would say that he will have this legacy, but regarding the elections, you know, I would say, I would agree with you that uh, they're nervous. They're not nervous about the result of the election because they know how to count, okay? And they know that uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich will remain in the Kremlin. But the problem is with Putin himself because he wants uh, a present. He wants a nice victory. He doesn't want a next victory. Glory. He wants, yes, glory, applause, and, and he wants sincere feelings. Can you imagine? The guy wants to be loved. It's so naturally. Yes. I want a man like Putin, like that song. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's, uh, they're nervous for how to make it pleasant for, for the boss and how to make it look pleasant and nice. Not nasty. <laughs> right, because the 2012 election was contentious and nasty. Yeah. And he even wept 
when he sort of had that victory speech in March 4th, whatever it was, 2012. Mm. I guess that's you know that's the Wellesley way. We won't we won't want to make it pleasant for Putin, <laughs> right? Any other well, thoughts here? Well, can I just? I mean, I think also the Kremlin. It's alliterative, right? So I mean, what, one asks the same question, right? Why are they apparently worried about the election when it's clear who's going to win? But they want to make it. I mean, beyond just the personal, they want to make it appear really a legitimate le election um, uh, and enthusiastic. And enthusiastic. Yeah. Uh, and that's why when, you know, teenagers went out in the street and they've been protesting, right. um, you know, they, they really don't like that, even though these teenagers are on a threat to them. But the idea that young people who were the Putin generation, they're born, you know, after he came to power or when he came to power. Um, so they want to make it look, uh, you know, as legitimate as they can, both domestically and I think to the outside world, yes, too. I agree. Yeah. If it really was a legitimate election, what would he win by? Would he win? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. No. It's so so uh, the question election, is, what would, would he win really win? Anyway? So I, I mean, you can correct me. My understanding is that the Duma elections, right, the last ones, less than what twenty percent of people in Moscow voted. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's an interesting question. If it was really uh, an election where they didn't, you know, the initial plan was to have seventy percent of 10 out, 70%, and 70% of victory, okay? Now they decided that 70% of 10 out hardly achievable, maybe in some controlled republics of North Caucasus, well, uh, but definitely legitimate in their eyes victory would be to have more, well, officially, more than 50% 10 out, and more than 50% of victory. But it can be achieved mechanically. No, no, but I think his question is if they didn't yeah, how many act creatively with numbers. If there was a <laughs> real way, like well, it's so easy. No, 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 no. But that's not the question is hypothetically. <laughs> if Putin stood for election and there was no shenanigans, what percent of the population this is would vote for him? This is impossible. Well, usually, well, uh, the uh, percentage of uh, so-called of added votes goes between 15 and 30 percent, usually, in our elections. Yeah, but the latest polls from Nevada, the only sort of independent you know, polling agency, found that something like, I don't know, 58 percent of people, if the elections were held next Sunday, they would vote for Putin. But of course, another 18% were willing to vote for a fictitious candidate. <laughs> <laughs> the poll wanted to see how powerful Putin was. One question was, President Putin said that he would like as his successor Alexei Semyonov. Um, how many of you have heard of Alexei Semyonov? Well, people said they never heard of him, but 15% said they would actually vote for him anyway. And 3% said they had heard of him. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a tremendous amount of authority coming out of the Kremlin. So, I mean, if the polls are saying that, you know, next week they would vote for Putin, he, he would win anyway. Uh, he will win. But and by, not by a huge margin. Mean, but win. the problem is 35% uh, of Russians do believe that the results of the polls could not be trusted mm -hmm. for one reason. People do not tell truth. Uh, Can you imagine, that. you know, the poster knock knocks at the door and says, Mr. Ivanov, are you registered here? Yes. Are you going to vote for Putin? Hmm, of course, yes. <laughs> right, well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I'm an historian, I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> You're blessed. Huh? Right. Um, yes? Uh, so you mentioned Levada, and I think at this time last year we talked about. Um, I forget who said it, but somebody said that there was pressure. There was pressure for Levada to close, and I was wondering if that pressure still existed or if there's any kind of timeline perceivable. It exists, it exists yeah. and the pressure was uh, and uh, uh, really serious because it's in the list of the so-called foreign agents, which of course is a bizarre and very complicated situation. But they do exist, they do function, and they will be functioned so far in a very complicated situation. Right, and thank goodness for that. Yeah, Jason. Um, on our last talk here, um, Professor Lagvinenko described to us some, some interesting turn of affairs in which you know, there's been some modest economic recovery uh, in relation, in response to sort of the sanctions and uh, emphasis on, on the uh, domestic economy. Have you seen evidence of this? Do you, and do you see sort of room for a, a turn inward and a disengagement strategy 
from this conflict. Um, so it's from which conflict? <clears throat> so this, this stand-up with, with the West, with America. Um, is, it may not say that. Or it, the question came to be, have you seen uh, anything, the stirrings of recovery? Uh, Economic recovery? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I am at a loss, you know, when uh, I'm thinking about the economic situation. Because you should make conclusions about economy on the basis of uh, relevant, adequate economic estimates that you get from the Statistical Bureau. But if Statistical Bureau is subordinated to the government, okay, and if uh, the guys are not independent, how could I rely upon the information that when they say that, you know, well, uh, the, the, the crisis is over, we are stabilizing, we are growing. I don't believe them because, well, I'm going to the grocery and I know what my salary is and I know, you know, how the people are living around. And I don't see any signs, firstly, of social recovery, of social trust, and secondly, of economic growth. Well, I would say, I, of course, I rely, I mean, I read different statistics. And I think most economists, and maybe it's just because the Western economists use the Russian statistics, <laughs> yes. would say that there is, you know, the growth rate is predicted to be maybe 2 or 3% this year, and that Russia has uh, weathered the worst of the combination of falling oil prices, Western sanctions, and the lack of structural reform. Um, so I'll tell you one anecdote um, at the, uh, and this, and you'd say, I mean, the Russian counter sanctions, right, as you indicated, have actually stimulated Russian agricultural production. So at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum this year, the U.S. ambassador now gone, Ambassador Joan Teft came. Uh, he's from Wisconsin, bear that in mind. And he was waylaid on his way to one of the panels by a Russian farmer who came with a huge cheese wheel. <laughs> and he presented him the cheese ambush. He presented him with a cheese wheel. And he said, look, your sanctions, well, actually, not our sanctions, it's Putin's counter sanctions. They've enabled me to produce this cheese, <laughs> true, which Russians didn't produce before. I think they produced Parmesan now. So Ambassador Teft, ever the diplomat, said, um, thank you so much. I'm from Wisconsin, and I, and I love cheese, and I'll take this from you. <laughs> but I mean, there's been so. You may be right that this, you know, your personal experience may indicate something different. But I think at least in some in some parts of the agricultural sector in Russia, are now doing better because of these counter sanctions. Well, uh, it looks like they're doing better in some areas, but I would never buy, you know, the kind of cheese you are. <laughs> 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 uh, I would trust the high school of economics that says that mm -hmm. counter sanctions were the most painful instrument when we are cutting our own, you know, limbs, heads, uh, the airs, etc., etc. Because counter sanctions brought uh, the raise, the price hike. Uh, well, uh, according to high school economics, the fo in the following way, you know, our dairy mm, is now, well, cost higher 25%. The meat, chicken, etc., between 15 and 30%. Okay? So, yes, we have them, but it's yeah. much more expensive, and the quality is not the Italian quality. No. <laughs> Russian Parmesan is no, the yeah. Italian quality. I mean, we should, we should end this, you know, with cheese. Oh, like, I mean, the tragedy, remember when they were destroying, uh, like, tons yeah. of brie? <laughs> and then now it's hard for us, because, like, when I go to Russia, I have to fly either through Paris or through Amsterdam so I could bring cheese, but I buy at the airport on the way. You know, they're not going to have me if I fly, you know, just direct from the States. Next time, don't forget right, about Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to breathe. Right, so the round is the cheese, and we thank our panelists.